Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first in our Material History Seminar series for 2024. Today, we'll be discussing fashion in black and white. I'm Luke James from Deakin University, and I'm delighted that you've been able to join us. Let me begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and thank them for their care of culture and country and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge other uh, First Nations people who may be joining us uh, today. So by way of background, Material Histories is a seminar series offered by jointly by the Old Treasury Building, Deakin and Australian Catholic University. In each discussion, we explore aspects of material history through an object or series of objects. The seminars are open to anyone interested in material history, and we hope to cast the subject net widely in, in terms of time and place. So if you're interested in contributing, please get in touch. We'll add a link for where to do so at the end of the seminar. Our two speakers, Lorinda Kramer and Margaret Anderson, will share their material histories with us on fashion in black and white as part of the PayPal Melbourne Fashion Festival's independent program for 2024. It's my pleasure to first introduce Lorinda Kramer. Lorinda is lecturer in cultural heritage and museum studies at Deakin University and researches Australian dress and fashion across the 19th and 20th centuries for insights into gender, class, power, and identity. She's been part of a curatorial collaboration for an exhibition soon to open at the National Trust of Australia New South Wales property, Old Government House in Parramatta, which is titled Back to Black. Lorinda will present Wearing Black from Funerals to Fashion. Over to you, Lorinda. Thank you so much for that introduction, Luke. So having lived in Melbourne for decades, I'm no stranger to wearing black. Plenty of fashion commentators call it the uniform of our city. Some do this with pride, others with a hint of despair. They suggest it might be to do with our attitude, or it might reflect our climate, and particularly our grey skies in winter. Or wearing black might imply a kind of sartorial caution or even apathy. On the other hand, black might reflect a refined sophistication. Melbourne, it's time to stop wearing black a headline in the Age newspaper encouraged a year ago, urging us to wear more colour. This is just one example of Black's fashionable twists and turns across time and place that have a history of their own. A few colours, or more rightly shades, so readily suggest contrasting meanings as Black it can signal rebellion or authority. It can gesture to passion or conservatism. It can express grief or glamour. Black is full of drama, but it's also subtle, used to blend in rather than stand out. I've been thinking about Black's cultural history and its colourful history, the upcoming exhibition, Back to Black, opening an old government house in Parramatta later this month, as I've worked in a collaborative curatorial process with the National Trust of Australia, New South Wales, curator of Parramatta Properties, Anna Ridley, and National Institute of Dramatic Art costume alumna, Lucy Francis. I've also been thinking about Black's material history and the opportunities and benefits of paying close attention to the surfaces of cloth. So it all started as I examined the National Trust of Australia New South Wales dress collection last year. I spent days in the National Trust collection stores in order to write a significance assessment, a document that captures why and how the collection is important by thinking about its historic, its aesthetic or artistic, scientific or research, and its social or spiritual significance. As I opened box after box to get a sense of the breadth and the depth of the collection, I recognised its capacity to reflect stories of migration and global networks and of Australian consumer culture and the development of Australian fashion. I recognised too how it captured high fashion 
just as it revealed home-based practices of dressmaking and sustainable reuse. But as I peeled back layers of tissue paper to examine the box's contents, black appeared again and again. Black hats, shoes, fans, purses, parasols and aprons. Black gowns, skirts, coats and other items of dress. Some worn for every day and others saved for special occasions. Black dominated this collection. It was one gown in particular, though, that stopped me in my tracks. And it's the one you see here in this slide. Boxed, it is a little difficult to see how astonishing it is. So let me provide you with some detail. This silk satin gown dates to around the late 1870s or early 1880s. The rich black sets off a riot of red, pink and green embroidery running from neck to hem. The gown was made to fit the figure closely at the front, while the back features bustle topped by an eye-catching bow. This bustle is given shape by internal horsehair stiffening, though others from this time could be shaped by a series of tape ties. The skirt features gathered bands and the hem is pleated. Black lace running the length of the gown adds yet another flourish. Even in its archival box, without seeing its dramatic silhouette, the gown caught my eye for the way light and shadow played across the cloth as the black created a striking contrast for the vivid embroidery and through texture by lace and corrugations. It was a curious gown and we wondered whether something so extravagant could have been worn for mourning, as many black gowns at this time were. And if so, what this might tell us about the widow who donned what appeared in some ways to be particularly joyous. We, of course, have a long history of wearing black. Black was worn in the ancient world and for centuries to follow. From Greek and Roman mourners and austere Benedictine monks, a luxurious black was later adopted by Europe's wealthiest, then its royalty. It rose, fell, then rose in popularity again in years to come, largely worn by those who could afford the costly cloth or in a muted form. And this is because black was difficult to produce using only natural materials from vegetable or animal sources. One 16th century method used barks and roots. Another time-consuming series of dyes that progressively darkened the cloth began with indigo, then an overdyeing with brown tannin or a reddish brown dye. Natural black dyes were more likely to fade to an unappealing brown or blue, particularly those produced more cheaply or quickly. So rich, deep black came to vividly mark status. But wearing black changed profoundly in the mid 19th century. Two events brought about this seismic shift. The first was the invention of synthetic dyes, beginning with mauveen, which dyed cloth a rich mauve colour. This was followed by a range of other aniline dyes. Many were bright, including yellows, reds and violets, and some women's gowns combined these colours as fashions for bold, strong hues took hold. And black was also a prized new synthetic dye, more stable, longer lasting and easier to apply than natural alternatives. The second event that played an enormous role in increasing Black's popularity at this time was the death of Prince Albert in 1861, as Queen Victoria donned Black to mourn her beloved husband. She continued to dress in Black across the next 40 years until her own death to express her profound loss. Elaborate Victorian-era mourning rituals solidified at this time. Widows followed Queen Victoria's lead, guided by etiquette around stages or degrees of bereavement that moved from full to ordinary to half mourning, 
Lusterless black fabrics were adopted for full mourning, unadorned but for crepe trim. Recognised by its crimped, stiffened appearance, crepe became known as the cloth of mourning. By the time half mourning had been reached, other quiet colours were introduced back into widows' wardrobes. Grey, white and purple were worn in this final phase. Others mourned loved ones too, but were not as bound to the same intense display of, gr as, uh, of grief as widows. Special sections for mourning wear developed in drapery and department stores to cater for the need for black clothes for men, women and children, and this is an example from Borden Brothers in Sydney. Mourning sections offered crepe trim for bonnets and armbands, together with a range of black cloths and jewellery, primarily jet before women could return to wearing diamonds and pearls as the least colourful of jewels, while emeralds and rubies, for example, were considered in bad taste for mourning because of their colour. The hair of loved ones was also fashioned into mourning brooches and bracelets, like this beautiful example of the hair of Anne Drysdale. Mourning sections in drapery and department stores were popular into the first decades of the 20th century, Though mourning practices transformed with the First World War, as Australians experienced overwhelming losses of their loved ones. By then, black had well and truly become available to the masses. Servants had begun to wear black uniforms, paired with crisp white aprons and caps in the second half of the 19th century. Before then, servants might have worn the cast-off clothes of their employer. It was not uncommon for clothes to pass through many hands as they slowly wore out, from the lady of the house to her daughter to her servant, and then into the second-hand market, where clothes might have another life as rags or even be reconverted back into cloth through being shredded and mixed with other materials, then respun and rewoven. But a servant in a black dress with a right apron was clearly the help, and thus avoided confusion or potential embarrassment when visitors called. Professional men had also adopted black, dressing in black frock coats and morning coats with black trousers and top hats in the 19th century when they went into town. This ensemble came to represent power and authority for its wearers. This transformed into black business suits in the 20th century, including those you'll see on the men seated at the right of this tram heading to Spencer Street. These business suits were commonly three-piece with a jacket, trousers and waistcoats, though two-piece suits would slowly become more popular. And black had also begun to appear as elegant evening gowns. In the 1920s, as hemlines rose and silhouettes straightened, knee-length black dresses appeared. They glittered with beads and sequins, like this one that's heavily embellished. Others were animated by feathers and fringes. Coco Chanel's little black dress first made its mark that decade and endures as a fashion staple today. The simple, if not minimalist, lines of the little black dress were revolutionary and crossed between day and evening wear. A little black dress could be paired simply with a pearl necklace, like this young woman adopted, together with a large bow in her hair, for an elegant appearance. The sleek lines of the 30s continued into the 40s, driven by World War II, um, driven in World War II, excuse me, by government-enforced clothes regulations. These restrictions controlled the shape of clothes and the amount of cloth used, with the aim to save vital resources for the war effort. Introduced in 1942 and adapting in years to follow, the newly introduced restrictions meant two rather than three piece suits for men, no more double-breasted jackets, trousers no wider than 19 inches, and no buttons on sleeve cuffs. 
for women the regulations outlined a banning of excessive fullness in skirts, a minimum of shirring, tucking and pleating, a reduction of full or wide sleeves and of elaborate embroideries or appliques. Evening gowns, evening cloaks and evening wraps were not permitted to be made in these 1942 regulations. These styles were known for both men and women as victory suits or victory fashions, as well as austerity styling. Black gowns gave way in the post-war period to the dramatic silhouette introduced by Christian Dior. The full skirt of the new look was an exciting shift from the restrictions imposed during the Second World War. These new skirts contrasted in their exuberant use of cloth. Black continued to attract wearers in the second half of the 20th century as youth cultures and youth subcultures flourished. New forms of leisure emerged and so did new styles of clothes. Young people began to dress differently from their parents and a youth clothing market flourished. Rockers, punks, goths and other groups eagerly embraced Black's dramatic, dramatic subversive power, wearing it as leather, denim or PVC. Beneath clothing, underwear was shifting too, from conventional white as sexier, more alluring Black lace lingerie became popular. Black underclothes had, in fact, long been worn. Widows wore black corsets, for example, under their mourning clothes. Though elsewhere, black was still unusual, with one newspaper in 1889 referring to the modern idea of black underwear. Black was especially suited to wearing under thin black dresses in the first decades of the 20th century, as it provided a good base colour. Even though, even then though, it was considered dowdy, with a pale blue, for example, thought to be more youthful. The supportive brassiere was patented in 1914, and a more popular design of bra entered the market five years later. In the 1920s, the shape of the bra shifted, with the then fashionable slim body shape reducing the focus on the bust. Black and black lace became more popular in decades to follow, including on still risque teddies in the 1930s and 40s. It was in the second half of the 20th century that black lingerie really took hold, available in stretchy, body-skimming, new synthetic fabrics that had skyrocketed in the 1950s and 60s, and as fashionable body shapes continued to change. So as I draw to a close, let me return now to the National Trust collection. What did looking closely at Black reveal? It might be stating the obvious, but I quickly came to appreciate that Black is not consistent or uniform in how it appears to the eye. Black can have different intensities, ranging from the faded to something deep and rich. It can have different tinges, can be blue-black or red-black, for example, or have a hint of gold or another metallic. Black velvets can absorb light, while silk satins can reflect it back. This can create a matte appearance or something akin to an oily or glossy black sheen. And black can come alive with beads, sequins, studs, tassels, lace and feathers, creating an additional sense of movement and texture on the cloth. It sets off those colours placed on or around it in a way that's hard to match by other colours. This, I'd like to suggest, is why black is so malleable and so versatile, why it can be stark or sophisticated or subversive. And in this, black opens up many possibilities for its diverse wearers. Thank you. Thank you, Lorinda, um, for that uh, wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, and I just particularly um, enjoyed listening to you tracing the, the symbolic, economic and 
practical, uh, literally material dimensions in the history of um, something we we take so for granted, especially here in Melbourne, as, as you mentioned. Um, I'd like to now introduce our second speaker, Margaret Anderson. Margie is the director of the Old Treasury Building, which we I'm sure we all know very well. Uh, and in a career spanning many decades, she also held senior musician museum positions in Western Australia and South Australia, and in the 1980s was foundation director of the Migration Museum. Margie pioneered discussions in Australia, encouraging museums to partner with community groups and has special research interests in women's history and material history. Today, Margie is presenting a paper titled The Bride Wore White, The Rise and Rise of White in Fashion. Over to you, Margie. Thank you, Luke. And uh, Lorinda, thank you for that wonderful introduction on black. So now we move to white. Like many of us, I receive regular emails from retailers hoping to entice me to buy online. Late last year, this email arrived just as I was thinking about an abstract for this paper, and it immediately struck a chord. It was advertising new season linens and began with the byline, it doesn't get more classic than white linens. Not long afterwards, another email popped into my inbox suggesting that I should, quote, keep it classic in a white t-shirt. White t-shirts are classic for a reason, it added. But what reason, I hear you ask? Although each of these fashion bra brands offers clothing in many colours, it is only white that is described as classic. So why might this be? In her recent entertaining book, Pizzazz, The Impact and Resonance of Wearing White, Nina Edwards begins her exploration of white clothing by investigating its classical origins. She stops short of suggesting a direct link between what we might call classical modes of dress, as in dress in ancient Greece, Rome or the Middle East, and modern usage of the term. But she does make the point that white clothing was much prized in those early societies. Now, we, of course, mostly draw our conclusions about the clothing of these ancient civilizations from their statuary, which is now uniformly white. But that is mostly because the original, sometimes quite gaudy pigmentation has worn away. We know that. But those who first rediscovered these ancient treasures did not. In their 18th century imagination, the classical was invariably associated with white. And this was the look that they attempted to replicate in dress of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. There was some historical basis for this fashion look. We know from ancient texts that white clothing was highly prized by ruling elites in the ancient world for the simple reason that both making it and maintaining it were extremely expensive. It was simply not practical for everyday wear unless one was extremely wealthy, which was precisely the point it was meant to signal. Some ancient societies also associated white clothing with purity. In ancient Rome, the priestesses known as the Vestal Virgins wore white robes, while Western art from the Middle Ages depicted celestial beings like angels in white robes. But such clothing was not for ordinary people, and that continued to be the case for most of the population until well into the Industrial Age. Most people wore white on only two occasions in their lives, when they were born and when they died. And even then, the term white should probably be applied loosely. Where white was used consistently in fashionable dress was in collars, fichus, caps, decorative aprons and trimmings. And lace was especially important in fashion from the 17th until the 19th centuries. At first, it was almost all white. It was worn in profusion by both men and women, until the beginning of the 19th century when it was banished from male fashion. The first lace emerged from embroidery sometime in the 16th century. And at first it was made by a needle, was very laborious. But it is probably the wonderfully filmy lace woven by lace makers using bobbins that is most recognizable today. Bobbin lace reached new heights in the 17th century, partly as a result of a climate event. 
A mini ice age at this time saw a cooling of the climate, creating ideal conditions for producing high quality flax. This flax was strong enough to be spun into very fine linen thread. And this is what we see in use in bobbin lace of this period. The work is sometimes so fine that the individual threads can only be seen under a magnifying glass. The lace of the quality shown on this collar required a large number of bobbins and was worked on a cushion. It was meticulous work and some large lengths of lace might take a worker more than a year to create. Although the lace makers were poorly paid, the cost of lace was exorbitant. Only the very rich could afford it. And there were many stories of elite families literally bankrupting themselves, trying to keep up appearances in lace. So no wonder they often chose to be painted, showing their lace collars and flounces. This particular portrait of Queen Marie Antoinette of France was probably just about enough to condemn her, uh, condemn her to the guillotine a few years later for the lace alone. But it was positively restrained compared to the spectacular dress worn by her mother, the Empress Theresia of Austria, in the early 1750s. This gown had an overdress made entirely of fine bobbin lace and would have been worth a small fortune. The portrait and the dress was intended to position her as the first lady of Europe. But meanwhile, the lace makers usually worked in very poor conditions. The fine thread had to be worked in a humid environment to stop it breaking. And lace workers often worked in damp rooms in poor light for many hours each day. There was a human cost to this exquisite textile, which was mostly hidden from the fashionable gaze. What finally transformed lace and lace making was the arrival of the machine in the 19th century. This made lace instantly affordable for many more people, but of course destroyed the livelihood of most lace workers. Some lace making survived, including the English Honiton lace and embroidered neck laces, but the fine lace of the past was gone. But the early 19th century saw the arrival on the scene of one item of male fashion that has survived to this day, the white dress shirt. It was not that men didn't wear shirts before this, they did, but they were seen more as underwear. From the early years of the 19th century, the white shirt became an item of great importance in its own right, thanks possibly to the fashion sway held by the prominent dandy Beau Brummel, seen here in car caricature. Brummel's dress distinction rested partly on his impeccably presented white linen shirt and an elaborately folded cravat. The cravat was also of white linen, carefully laundered and starched. Brummel was said to crumple many cravats each day in his attempts to achieve perfection in its folding. It was an affectation that rested entirely on his ability to spend lavishly and to employ others to do his laundry. In the 19th century, as in earlier times, wearing a white shirt was a mark of class. Working men didn't wear white shirts for obvious reasons. Later, men were described as working in either white collar roles, meaning clerical or managerial, or blue collar or manual worker roles. At first, their white collars were stiff and starch, which made them easier to wash clean, but also very uncomfortable to wear. From the 1820s, detachable collars became available. Those were attached to the shirt with buttons and could be removed for washing and starching. It meant that the entire shirt didn't have to be washed each day, and it probably meant that more men were able to afford to wear white shirts. At first, their shirts were made from linen. Indeed, linen was a shorthand term for shirts and or underwear at this time. But as cotton became cheaper, cotton shirts increasingly replaced linen. Men's shirts in both linen and cotton were advertised in Melbourne newspapers in the 19th century, along with some that were described as linen fronted shirts, unfortunately not illustrated. Now, while the cloth for shirts was mostly imported, most of the shirts themselves were made in local workshops 
by women employed as seamstresses. At first, all shirts were made entirely by hand. But from the 1860s, machines replaced many of these women. Those who were left worked increasingly as machinists and as hand finishers, making buttonholes, sewing on buttons, and completing other fiddly tasks. By the end of the century, many of these were poor women, employed as art workers and paid by the piece. Now, unfortunately, sewing was a skill almost all women learned, and so employers had their pick of workers. Wages were usually pitifully low. In the 1890s in Melbourne, there were repeated campaigns against this sweated labour, but there was little appetite for mandating proper wages and conditions for those women. But nevertheless, equipping a gentleman in sufficient white shirts could be an expensive business, especially if convenient laundry facilities were not to hand. When Evan Kiffin Thomas sailed to England for his wedding in 1900, his fiancée, Mary Archer Smith, known as Maisie, wrote to advise him on his shipboard wardrobe. You will want about three dozen shirts, because, you see, it means dressing every evening, and in hot weather, shirts have a way of crumpling up. You can get washing done at Colombo, but I don't think it's wise. By 1900, shirts were also well established as an item of women's dress. For most of the period until the 1880s, women's dresses were either made in one piece or as a separate, although matching, bodice and skirt. A kind of blouse made a brief fashionable appearance in the 1860s, often worn with a little bolero style jacket. But by the 1870s, dresses were once again made in one piece with a tight, form-fitting bodice and sweeping skirts caught up by a bustle at the back. As women became increasingly active, playing sports like tennis and bicycle riding, they needed something simpler. And a form of shirt, sometimes called a shirt waist, and at other times described as a blouse, made an appearance. By the 1890s and into the 1900s, it was common for gentlewomen to wear shirt waists or blouses, often with a skirt and jacket. But it was also worn by women working in shops, or in the new middle-class occupations of typewriting or telephony. Some of these shirts could be quite elaborate constructions, as illustrations in the Melbourne newspapers reveal. But by about 1910, the designs more resemble a modern shirt, and were perhaps modelled on men's dress or evening shirts of the period. As women moved more and more into public roles, the uniform of the dark suit and blouse or shirt was their frequent choice. The one aspect of women's dress throughout this time that was almost uniformly white was underwear, as Lorinda has said. A black petticoat might be worn under a dark dress, but generally underwear was a respectable white, as were nightgowns. There may be a link here between old notions of purity and white cloth. In the 19th century, infants were also uniformly dressed in white, and by the end of the century, pristine white cotton dresses were fashionable wear for girls and young women. Again, most of the young women we see wearing this clothing were wealthy. But one item of white clothing that was more common was the white cotton pinafore, worn over young girls' dresses to keep them clean. We see these pinafores being worn by children across the social spectrum, with the probable exception of the very poor. Now, there was one, of course, other item of women's clothing that emerged during the 19th century, and that has endured into the present, and that is the white wedding dress. Working as we do in the old Treasury building, home to the Victorian marriage registry, we see many hundreds of brides every year. Not all of them wear white, but the vast majority do. So why is this? And what do we know about the history behind the white wedding dress? First of all, wearing white to be married was not the norm for most of modern history. Until the late 19th century, most brides simply wore their best dress and expected to wear it many times afterwards. 
It's Queen Victoria who's credited with beginning the fashion for white bridal gowns. For her marriage to Prince Albert in February 1840, she wore a gown in ivory satin with a deep flounce of Honiton lace and a matching veil. Her journal didn't record why she chose to dress in white, but where royalty led, others followed. It helped that reproductions of the wedding painting circulated widely in the British Empire. In 1863, her daughter-in-law, Princess Alexandra of Denmark, also chose white for her marriage to Prince Albert Edward, and this was the first royal wedding to be photographed. Again, the photographs were widely circulated. Nevertheless, the white wedding dress took some decades to catch on. White was not a practical colour for all the reasons we've seen. Even in the 19th century, most fabrics didn't launder well, and the concept of wearing a dress on only one occasion seemed quite scandalous. Even Queen Victoria repurposed her wedding dress for evening wear. Brides in Victoria continued to marry in coloured dresses for some decades. But by the end of the century, it seems clear from surviving photographs that fashionable brides were wearing white or cream. The detailed descriptions of these weddings, often printed in the newspapers, bear that out. In August 1898, for example, the Australasian's correspondent, who published under the wonderful pseudonym Queen Bee, described the wedding dress worn by the governor's second daughter, Sylvia Madden, for her marriage to Clement Balage. In what was described as a brilliant wedding, Queen Bee wrote, The bride looked exceedingly pretty and distinguished in her gown of rich white satin duchesse, veiled in cloudy white tulle, the whole being spangled with silver and embroidered with crystal. Her court train was also of satin duchesse, draped with limerick point lace. In place of the orthodox bouquet, she carried a white pebble. Now here we can see most of the elements that would become traditional over the next decades. Think of a white gown with a train, the veil, although not on this occasion, the bouquet of flowers. By the turn of the 20th century, the white wedding was firmly entrenched in fashionable circles, although the style of the dress followed the fashion of the day. At this time, it simply didn't occur to brides that their gowns should be made in anything but the latest fashions. And so we see gowns like these with long flounced skirts, with rising pre-war hemlines, and in the short skirted styles of the 1920s. As hems descended again, we see gowns in the form-fitting styles of the 1930s and 40s, and then the ballooning skirts of the 1950s. The gown I showed in my first slide today was worn by Elaine Colbert in 1947. It was made of ivory satin to Elaine's own design and was worn with a tulle veil. Because fabric was still rationed in 1947 after the Second World War, Elaine had to save many coupons to purchase the fabric for her dress. But by then, managing to have a white wedding was firmly established in the popular imagination. And to forego this was to miss out on something special. We're exhibiting this gown at present in the exhibition Belongings, Objects and Family Life. But from about the 1970s, wedding gowns increasingly diverged from the style of the day into a realm all their own. Think that famous bridal gown worn by Lady Diana Spencer for her marriage to then Prince Charles in 1981. It's more reminiscent of the 1950s, or even perhaps the 1850s, than the 1980s. And this has continued. Walk through any display of bridal wear today and you will see contemporary dresses mixed with many styles of the past, including this rather interesting gown, which is almost reminiscent of the late 17th century. And although white is not universally worn, it is still by far the most common choice of Western brides and by increasing number of brides from other cultural backgrounds. So far as I can see, this is because it is seen as traditional to wear white on one's wedding day, even if that means that the dress is a very expensive, one-off item of expenditure. Some call it the princess for a day experience. 
What is sometimes even the choice of same-sex couples, whose dress choice otherwise reflects contemporary style? When Kath Brackett and Anissa Thompson married in the midst of the COVID lockdown in 2020, they both chose to wear white. And what then of any assumed link between wearing white and moral purity? Well, certainly for many centuries, it was assumed that elite women would come to their marriage as virgins. We see the same symbolism applied to girls taking their first communion or making their debuts into polite society. But this was far less common amongst working people. At different times in the 19th century, the bridal pregnancy rate in Victoria was as high as 30%, despite widespread disapproval of premarital sexual activity. Now, about the same percentage of children are born out of wedlock without any social disapproval, whatever. But the tradition of the white wedding remains firmly in place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margie. And uh, uh, what a fantastic foil to Lorinda's paper. Um, I was fascinated on how both papers touched on uh, how both phases of life and forms of capital are embedded in, in these garments um, mm. produced in, in deceptively simple shades. Um, and also how both converged on Queen Victoria, who I interpret as a major influencer of her era, um, even before Instagram. Um, mm. Now, we'll open to questions from the audience for both Margie and Lorinda in a moment. Um, and please, if you have questions, I encourage you to add them now. But perhaps I'll start by asking to explore your approaches to working with dress in your research. Could I encourage um, Margie and Lorinda to you to ask uh, to respond to each other's paper um, and perhaps with a, a question or a reflection? Um, I was fascinated. And isn't it interesting? I also was not aware that black was so difficult a fabric to produce. Isn't it interesting? So that's an interesting thread in both papers. Mm. The other thing I was interested in was um, the notion of wearing black as being both traditional and um, in, in mourning, of course, as a sign of respect, but in underwear as potentially a daring choice. So there's a kind of a contrast there. And I wondered if you could comment on that at all. Yeah, Maggie, let me just quickly say about the black colour and how difficult it is to produce because I was really, really inspired by this idea that, that it was so time consuming and so difficult to produce using only natural materials. Mm. I, I had suspected that that was the case, but I hadn't known how difficult it was to produce the kinds of recipes that people tried and tried and tried again to try to create a really deep, rich black. It mm. took quite a bit of a trial and process. You know, it also then, you, know, you had the potential for your fabric to start to fade to something that was actually a really unpleasant colour. Mm. So mm. it was it was very, very very difficult to to produce and I, I think that you know that really speaks volumes about who then started to wear black and about that really momentous shift in the mid-19th century when these new um, aniline dyes were, were available um I think that that particular point is just it's 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 such a critical point in in black and as you've shown also in white as well um mm -hmm. but in terms of the contrasts in black this has absolutely captured my my attention and my imagination. And you can trace so many different contrasts from, you know, black being conservative but also dangerous, from black being, you know, what some people would call boring and other people calling it, you know, really subversive or exciting or dramatic. So mm. these contrasts, I think, just abound in wearing black. One of the things that you will have heard from my paper that I have been really intrigued to think more about is how the actual surface of the black can be so different. Mm. Yes, it's obvious that it is black, but that surface can be different in so many ways in terms of it being matte or shiny or sleek or oily looking. And I think that that plus the attitude that people wear black with can mm. really help to invest it with those contrasting meanings. It looks different on different people for that reason, I think. And wasn't it interesting, the slide you showed of the morning dress where the text at the bottom, which I was I was reading, was saying that how important it was that morning dress should not be obtrusive. 
<laughs> so the nature of the fabric that it's used to construct it, presumably. So you're not going to use your shiny satins or your lustrous velvets, perhaps, for mourning. You're going to wear the flat crepe or whatever. Absolutely. And for that, that first initial phase of full mourning, this idea of wearing very flat black, lustreless black, black was really heavily promoted so no you didn't want anything too extravagant for that initial phase because of this intense pressure to show your your mourning for your loved one it's it's just so so fascinating you know at the same time though even though you could be wearing this very um kind of lusterless black cloth you could still have a fashionable silhouette. So it wasn't seen as necessarily a bad thing to have a silhouette that was actually of that time and place, whether, you know, the silhouette was created through the sleeves or the skirt or the bustle, whatever those elements were. So you could still have that, that fashionable shape, the fashionable silhouette, provided you followed those conventions in the kinds of cloth that you were drawing on for your stages of mourning. Mm, I agree. And I think the same thing applies in, in terms of wedding dresses. Mm. I mean, there was just no notion that you would be married in anything other than the latest fashion, providing you could afford it, of course. That's the assumption that underpins all of this, isn't it? But I mean, at the point that there are not those evening fashions, presumably so easily replicated, um, we get this kind of nostalgic um, look back at the past. Um, mm. So there's, there's definitely a, a a point in time, isn't there, at which um, being dressed in the latest fashion stops being the most important thing for weddings, not necessarily um, in other contexts. Mm -hmm. And, of course, very few cultures still continue with the tradition of mourning in black, do they? Some do, but... Not so many. Not so many in Western society now. Western mm, societies, and and you know, World War One really shifted that that idea of of mourning and mourning conventions or mourning practices. One of the reasons for that was that simply so many people were mourning at once. Yes, so of you course. To have, um, you know, Australian women's magazines still advising people in the the thirties and forties who still have a concern about what is appropriate for mourning, still advising that. Um, you know, it's it's okay to reduce how you mourn in terms of the black clothing that you that you wore for the the length of time. So it, people are still really concerned. They're really um, confused, might be the right word, about what practices now are are accepted and what aren't, and how to move forward with these. Yes. Now, um, Margie and Lorinda, I have a question um, from Sally, who's just said thank you for the wonderful papers, uh, and she's. Also said, as you spoke about black and white fashions, she began to wonder about the idea of quiet, the current idea of quiet luxury and how it might apply to your analyses. And she's asked, do you think part of the appeal of both black and white is not only its capacity to be built upon um, uh, with for black dyes and decoration, but also that it relies upon the observers to be able to see the workmanship, um, the dye quality, the decoration, um, giving the example, a poorly dyed black dress is obviously cheaper. Mm. Would one of you like to respond to that? After you, Dorinda. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sally. That's a really great question and it's so nice to have you with us today. I think you're absolutely right. When you have something like this that does feel or seem like it's, it's stark in some way, I think it does then force the eye to look at the details, at the lines, at the quality, at the shape, at the workmanship and so on. So I absolutely agree that you can't hide, I think that might be the right word, you can't hide um, bad workmanship, bad dye, for example, when you have that that sense of, of quiet luxury, as you say. Margie, would you say the same? Yes, I would. And I mean, the point she makes about the capacity to build upon things, I mean, obviously, in the case of the, the white shirts we all wear, mm -hmm. the white T-shirts we all have, it's partly because they go with everything, isn't it? You, so you can you can choose to put a white shirt under a suit of any colour pretty well and know that it will be okay. But it's a, it's an interesting point that she makes about workmanship. And, and I guess in the fashions that we're now buying, that's partly to do with the quality of the fabric, isn't it? Um, and there's an increasing um, emphasis on, say, organic cottons or and, and, and linen um, and, all, and all of that, but also the workmanship because, of course, the cut 
and and the workmanship and any sort of embellishment is much more evident when you're not distracted by different colors so i think sally thanks for that question it's a great question and and um it's a really thoughtful um question it made me think as i was reading it thank you thank you very much uh, uh both of you for that for that answer um i do have one more question um do you oh, sorry i've Yes, I do. Uh, do you have any comments on the preservation of these fabrics? And sorry, this is from, um, I think it's C. Harlow. Um, do you have any comments on the preservation of these fabrics, given that we are making most of these conclusions based on items that are decades or even hundreds of years old and thus uh, black uh, fading uh, and, and white, obviously, you know, doing the opposite? Um, and I, I must admit I had the same a very similar thought um, when I was looking at the black and white photographs and how much we can rely on shades being interpreted as as black versus brown or purple and so forth. Mm. Over yeah. to you. Shall I start? Yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely, and a, a you know a bit of a longer version of this paper. I did make a comment about black and white photographs and how most of the women's shirts, for example, that were sold in the nineteenth and twentieth century actually came in a range of colours. But it's very difficult to know that from the photographs we're looking at until we get into colour photography. Um, I'll leave Lorinda to talk about black fading, um, it, which it notoriously does. White fabric, of course, actually lasts amazingly well. And fabrics like linen um, are incredibly robust. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they always were. And I've wondered whether part of the reason actually why underwear and an infant's clothing was always white was because it washed. Well, cotton did, cotton and linen did, wool not so much. Um, but you could wash it, you could boil it. And so effectively, even though they didn't know about sterilisation until later in the 19th century, they did know about removing stains. And boiling wash is a very effective stain remover. So white fabrics have often lasted extremely well. What often doesn't last very well are some of those aniline dyes, though. Lorinda, do they? they because they I think they start to rot the fabric, don't they? They, they can, they can. Um, look, this, this is a really, really great question. And I also was going to make a comment about, you know, the use of black and white photos and, and my assumption that some of those photos that I'm looking at in black and white are actually black when they may very well have been another, a, a darker dye. Um, what I tried to do was put some context around them to look at what was being worn, to think about would that have been a morning gown, for example, what might give me an indication of that. So I may have taken a, a few liberties in my choices of those black and white photographs, but I am hoping that most of them were actually black in reality. In terms of fading of black, yeah, it was this was a really widely known problem. Um, and I think it, it, it still is today with our, with our black synthetic dyes. You know, if you have a black T-shirt and you hang it out in the, the sun mm -hmm. uh, on the line too many times, it, it does tend to fade very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's because when I think it's rich and, and, and deep and dark, it is such a beautiful black colour and you, your eye can pick up the changes in the fading really readily. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it, it is a notorious colour for, for fading over time, particularly with sun and sun damage. I'm not sure if that's answered the question in in any kind of um, extended way, but I hope that that makes some sense. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if part of the point behind the question um, was, can we make these judgments based on old materials that we see, mm -hmm. um, some of which are better preserved than others, of course. I mean, that black dress that you started with, Lorinda, oh. with that wonderful red decoration oh, it's just what an interesting item of clothing that is it's really fabulous and so going back then to the national trust collection which i i hope i gave a sense of just how amazing and how um deep and rich it, it is mm. i was really shocked by the condition of the black in those garments in a good sense i don't mean shocked in a in a bad sense no, no. it was beautiful these 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 garments that the the black of them was just so Oh, so deep. It was just, it was so rich and so black. Um, and I was really surprised by then the age of some of them. So, for example, the one I showed you from the late 1870s, 1880s, that black was in incredible condition. It really was a very, very rich colour. Sometimes when I see gowns 
like that, it does make me wonder how much wear they've had. Yeah. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed doing as part of my research when I'm looking at collections is actually turning things inside out. I want to look at the interior of gowns. I want to see what kind of staining there is, whether, mm. Um, mm. and this sounds like I'm getting really, really intimate, whether there's perspiration stainings under the arms, for example, because that can give a really good sense of, of how much a gown was worn, whether it's been adjusted over time, because that can also show that it's possibly been worn by different generations, or been worn over an extended period when a woman has changed her own body shape. Mm. So I'm always really interested in turning things inside out as a kind of indicator of how much wear or how much life these, these gowns have had. But the mm. ones that I was looking at in the trust collections they were just in in such incredible condition that black just shone. It was gorgeous. Amazing. Thank you very much, uh, both Lorinda and, and Margie. Um, unfortunately, we do have to close now, but I'd just like to thank you very warmly, both for your papers. Uh, and I'd like to thank the team behind the Material History Seminar Series at the Old Treasury Building, Deakin and the Australian Catholic University. Thanks also to uh, PayPal Melbourne Fashion Festival's independent program. So as you can see on screen, our next seminar in the series is called Objects at Sea, which is to be held on Friday, 7th of June, 2024. And we would love it if you could join us. Thanks again for all your attendance, uh, interest and participation. Uh, and we've greatly enjoyed having you with us. We'd also just like to remind you that we welcome proposals for future seminars. Um, and please have a look at the Material Histories page on the Old Treasury Building's website. Thank you again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.